What is up everyone? Welcome back to another GeekerWatt video. Today I'm going to be using these parts behind me to build an $800 gaming PC build for 2020. Not only am I going to put it together, show you how it's done and run through the parts, but I'm also going to install loads of games on it later uh, so we can see exactly how well this system performs. And spoiler alert, there might even be a bit of ray tracing in there. And that's thanks to today's video sponsor, Pallet, and their NVIDIA RTX graphics cards, who want me to talk about ray tracing a little bit later on. For now though, let's jump into the build. Before I put this system together, I want to give you a super quick look at how it performs. Call of Duty's Warzone was seen around 75 FPS, Forza Horizon 4, Project Cars 2 and CSGO were all over 100 FPS. GTA 5 sitting around the 90 FPS mark, Overwatch pinned at 70 and Apex at a solid 100 frames per second. Battlefield 5 also looks insane with ray tracing on at 60 to 70 FPS, medium settings 1440p. We're going to kick things off by getting three components out of the way at once. Uh, the first is our motherboard. This is the MSI B450M Pro VDH Max. Now the name itself isn't all that important, uh, but the key bits to note, it's Micro ATX, which is the perfect size for a budget build. Uh, it supports Ryzen 3rd gen CPUs out the box with plenty of room for graphics cards, M.2 drives and our RAM. We're gonna install our CPU first off. This is the AMD Ryzen 5 3600. It's got six cores and 12 threads, uh, which our newer games will like particularly well, uh, with a base clock speed of 3.6 and a boost up to 4.2 gigahertz. That means the slightly older games that only like to use a couple of CPU cores or threads uh, are equally catered for. Finally, of the three components, we need to pop in our memory. Now this here uh, is Team Group's T-Force Delta RGB. I've gone for 16 gigs of RAM. I think eight is simply not enough in 2020, to be honest. A couple of years ago, eight would have been the perfect amount, but with games starting to swallow up more and more memory, this is gonna work a little bit better. You want to pull back the clips on the second and fourth slot, uh, lining up the notches on the two RAM dims with the notches on the corresponding RAM dim slot. I should say that it will only go in in kind of one orientation, uh, so don't force it, but you will need to give it just a little bit of pressure on both sides. Finally, I'm gonna grab the included CPU cooler uh, that you get for free with any Ryzen CPU, which is pretty incredible value really, and install this onto our CPU. It does come with pre-applied thermal paste, but because I've used it before, I will need to apply just a little smidgen of my own. That's about perfect. Although it is a bit more watery than normal. I'm sure it'll be fine. And just like that, with the fan cable plugged in, that's pretty much done for now. We're gonna pop this to one side uh, while we grab our case. This right here is the Cooler Master Q300L, and it's one of the cheapest cases on the market right now. At the budget end, you kind of, you really struggle with cases. If you go for something that like has loads of RGB on it, and that's kind of great, but then the feature set is pretty bad and the cable management's poor. And, and what I'm trying to get at here is a lot of cheap cases are really, really crap. This on the other hand is honestly pretty fantastic. Uh, what this does, which is really clever, is it basically gets rid of all the usual plastic panels and just uses dust filters with a nice design on the top to kind of form the overall look and aesthetic of the case. And from what I understand, it's been incredibly popular and deservedly so. To install our motherboard into the chassis, all you need to do first is pop the IO shield in. This comes with your motherboard and simply clicks uh, into the back of the case. Once that's in, all you then need to do is slide the motherboard into the case. It's easier if you lay the case down flat and it will sit nice and comfortably on top of each of the pre-installed motherboard standoffs. Alrighty, now that 
I don't even know what accent that was. Now that the motherboard's in the case, I'm next gonna pop in our power supply. This is Cooler Master's MWE650. It's 80 plus gold certified and fully modular, meaning you only plug in the cables you need, which will help in a small case like this to keep things looking nice and tidy. The next component to install in our build today is of course our graphics card and this is the Palit RTX 2060. When Nvidia brought out the super range they kept the 2060 non-super and dropped the price a whole load making it a really affordable way to get into RTX, to get into ray tracing but also to get pretty great 1440p gaming performance across the board and that's exactly what this card is good for. I kind of took my finger off the pulse with ray tracing a bit, I reviewed the 2060 when it when it came out and you can watch that video up here or up here, I, I can't remember which side it is. But I kind of took my finger off the pulse because there was only really Battlefield 5 and like Assetto Corsa and like Quake RTX. But now there are loads and loads more titles that support ray tracing. You'll see in the performance benchmark section later on exactly the performance hit ray tracing has. But to get true ray tracing, you need RTX because it has the extra processing cores that other cards simply don't have. And just like that, it is all done and installed. That was super duper easy. The next thing we're gonna pop in and the final component in today's build is our storage. And in this case, the SSD. I went for the SanDisk SSD Plus. It's a very affordable SSD, but with 500 gig or one terabyte capacities, working really, really well for this build, it gets rid of the need for a hard drive, which not only saves you money, but gives you super duper fast read and write performance. This thing's gonna boot up pretty quick. All in all, it's a great option. Which brings me on nicely to my customary cable management time lapse before booting it up, seeing how it looks, and then more importantly, how it performs. So without any further ado, roll the time lapse. It's much too early, or it's far too late Maybe I'm too old now, or just afraid that you'll walk away Okay then, ladies and gents, now you've seen just how good this system looks when it's all powered up and turned on, and kind of how to put the thing together, just how well does it perform? Now I'm gonna run through a load of games at 1440p, starting off with the non-ray tracing and finishing up with the ray tracing titles. All the games, as I said, are run at 1440p. Uh, I tend to turn anti-aliasing off and disable V-Sync so we can get nice high frame rates, but I will run through individual settings on the screen on a game by game basis. Now the first on my list is Forza Horizon 4. I've said it before, I'll say it again, I bloody love this game. Uh, we're seeing here 1440p Ultra at 104-105 FPS average. That's using the game's inbuilt benchmark mode. Uh, the real world performance, kind of just driving around and having fun, are slightly higher, but the benchmark mode gives a really easy comparable result. Racing games on the whole tend to be easier to run and Forza have kind of taken that advantage and sort of used it to add extra graphical detail and that kind of thing. You're not going to be getting the 200 FPS that you'd see in Project Cars, uh, but you do get a much more realistic immersive experience. Talking of Project Cars, I ran Project Cars 2 with high settings and was seeing 180 to 220 frames per second. That is is bonkers. Now every time I run Project Cars 2 I use the custom Dubai Aerodrome map with this cheeky little Mustang um, so if you want to go back through my other builds and compare them uh, and, and equally look at my future builds which you should totally get subscribed for um, oh, I, I, that was literally manufactured just to do that uh, then you can indeed do so. Uh, moving to a slightly easier to run game, CSGO, an all-time classic, an all-time favourite. We're seeing here very high settings, 230 frames per second. 
which is nuts. Now, this is uh, offline with bots, which means in the real world, your FPS should be slightly higher because the computer hasn't got to like generate the actions of the bots. Um, but to prevent annoying loads of other people uh, in online games, I didn't have the time, so bots it is on this occasion. Uh, GTA 5, another favourite of mine, a favourite of many people, uh, I imagine. 4K high settings we're seeing here, sort of 80 to 100 FPS using once again the game's inbuilt benchmarking mode. You will notice kind of all the bars in terms of like render distance and scaling and stuff are all set to half, but it is running at true 1440p high settings. GTA 5 is one of those games that just doesn't get old, and I'd hazard a guess you could probably get near enough 60 FPS in GTA 5 at 4K on this machine, which is utterly ridiculous. Talking of games that are ridiculous, Overwatch, my new addiction. Honestly, I just love this game. It's so quick and fun to play, you know, kind of defending uh, your base and capturing the flag and doing all sorts of that kind of fun stuff. If you haven't kind of played Overwatch much, I cannot recommend it enough. And there is a big upside. High settings, it was pinned at 70 FPS. Overwatch does this kind of weird thing where it kind of tries to keep the frame rate at a certain level, but never really dips below that. I would say that 1440p Ultra is going to give you some similar frame rates, slightly lower than 70, but you're not going to be seeing too much deviance on that front. The final non-ray tracing game on our list today, before we jump into some RTX titles, uh, is Apex Legends. It's another favourite of mine, actually. Um, I'm not quite as good at Apex as I am at Overwatch, which doesn't really make much sense because they're both first-person shooters. I think the pressure of Battle Royale games and working in like quite a small squad gets to me. I can't manage it. I can't handle it. Um, either way though, the system can handle it. The system was not feeling the pressure with 100 FPS pretty consistently at very high, uh, on the very high preset, 1440p. I did turn the GPU kind of texture memory down to 6 gigabytes, which matches this palette RTX 2060. Um, but apart from that, I used a very high preset, turned VSync off and didn't really touch anything else. I'm going to sort of take this chance to say how impressed I've been with this Palette 2060. It is a tiny card, it's got a single fan and is much smaller than the Founders Edition or even most of the aftermarket designs from MSR or Asus or even Palette themselves. I think it just goes to show that a GPU providing it, it doesn't get too hot. It doesn't really make much difference which card you buy. Moving on to our two ray tracing titles today and we're kicking things off with Battlefield 5. I use the Battle Royale mode, it's kind of becoming a bit of a theme of today's video. Every game now has a Battle Royale mode. And I've really, really got to say, this scene that it like spawned me into looked incredible. And if there is any example that best shows ray tracing, it is this one. Look at that sunset in the distance, look at it reflecting off that path. In this instance, it really makes a difference. Ray tracing in a racing game, I'm not quite so sure. Forza Horizon 4, maybe, but Project Cars 2 or Assetto Corsa, I'm alright, I'll pass. In this game though, this scene, you can really, really see the difference. Call of Duty's Warzone Free Battle Royale, yep, it's free to play, You can anyone can play it, costs nothing, um, is also another example where ray tracing has been implemented really, really well. We can see here it's more subtle, you know, it's a bit less obvious, but thus the performance sort of impact is going to be lower, and I've got to say, once again, they smashed it out of the park. Call of Duty Warzone had a cool kind of a few kind of cool plays uh, when I was giving it a go with this 2060. And really, if you're prepared to game at 1440p and not 4K, I can't really see the need to go any higher uh, than the RTX 2060 in terms of power and price to performance and all that good stuff. With that being said though, I think that pretty much wraps it up for today's video. If you did enjoy it, you know what to do, a big old like rating and make sure to get subscribed. Hit me up on Twitter, Instagram, all that good stuff. But as always, thank you very much for watching and we'll see you in the next Geek A What video.